Good morning, so glad you could join us. Uh, I went for a walk yesterday uh, because I, I wanted to go walk and pray. And I said to Heidi before I went, I said, you can pray because I don't know what I'm preaching on tomorrow. I mean, I've been reading this book. I got all sorts of ideas, but something just kind of has to resonate. It, there, there has to be something that pulls the whole thing together. And I forgot how much uh, back in the early days, the good old days of the pandemic. No, just kidding. But I would go for a walk and I would do voice to text, all kinds of stuff that I guess as I'm walking and praying, it's like, oh, that would work. That would work. I could plug this in here hard because I've walked a lot. So yesterday I was actually listening to a song by Mark Knopfler, Silvertown Blues. And he talks about these homeless men that are around a fire and a drum. And he refers to them as men with no dreams. And that just really struck me as a poetic way of, uh, of saying what their plight is. But it's not just homeless people that don't have dreams. How, how are your dreams doing? How are your hopes doing? Don Reed, uh, someone that I've known for a long time, passed away a number of years ago now. But I remember him saying, Paul, people can endure anything if they have hope. Hope is essential. What are our hopes? What are they based on? So Jesus tells this story. It's a parable. It's a really short one. Really small, short parable. And I don't think I ever really took it in before, but William Barclay, in his book on the parables of Jesus, I think really helped me to understand it's really about hopes. It's about dreams. And I'm, it kind of has a Chicago connect to it. And we'll see in just a few moments if you can catch up to my logic there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd speak through your word. Jesus took the time to tell this story for a reason, and I believe it was to give hope to his disciples, to his friends in the first century. And I believe he wants to do the same in the 21st century. I pray you do that today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Nothing could stand up. 
what are your dreams? What do you really hope for? How are your hopes and dreams doing? See, like I said, it's not just homeless people that live without dreams. There's a lot of wealthy, successful people that really don't have any dreams going anymore. They're just kind of going through the motions. Or as it's been put more eloquently, living out their lives in quiet desperation. Just kind of a silent scream. They're screaming, but it's not out loud. It's just on the inside. You know, every time I go by a restaurant that's shut down, I, I know that that was somebody's dream. To, to go through all of the effort to, to get a restaurant going, you know it's somebody's heart, it's their dream. A um, guy that lives on the corner right down the cul-de-sac from me at a restaurant in Lombard, and they shut her down during the, the pandemic. They, tra they stayed open as long as they could, but they just had a landlord that wouldn't work with them. And I know it's difficult for him. It's really devastating for his wife. And then I think of the place, the, it, the pizza place in the strip mall near my house. And uh, I went in one day, the guy's super friendly all the time, calls everybody brother. Um, maybe he really thinks I am his brother. I don't know. But he called everybody brother. And then this one time I went in there and he was just dropping F-bombs and he was closed within a week. Now somebody else is starting up a dream there. But everybody's got these dreams. There's so many shattered dreams. The tornado that, that hit Woodridge and, and Naperville just in the past week, uh, literally dreams are shattered. I uh, just got a report from, from someone from our church. Their daughter was, was really um, affected by it because it, it really struck the unit next door to her. And we've got a list of names of people that we want to help now, people that have lost their car, all sorts of different things. But things like that can happen really quickly. And then this crazy story from Florida, Surfside, I think, is the name of the community, South Beach, where this building collapsed. I mean, in a moment, dreams are shattered. People go through health issues, and, and we lose people unexpectedly, or even expectedly. Loss, any kind of death, shatters dreams. Divorce, so many dreams that don't come true, things that we hope for. The Bible tells us that hope deferred sickens the heart. But when we lose hope completely, it's even worse than just a sick heart. If it's not just deferred, it doesn't come to fruition at all. How do we deal with that? And then there's some dreams that seem to trickle away for decades. And it takes a long time before we realize that something's dead, that something's lost, that something's never coming back. So you've got Jesus and his haloed friends. You ever see the paintings? You know, they've all got their, their halos on and everything. And I think we do them a disservice by putting halos on them. Why do I say that? Because they were just normal people. They were people like you and I are. And they're like we are here in the 21st century. I gotta tell you something, somebody sent this to me the other day. Were you aware that Monday evening at 21 minutes past nine, it was the 21st minute of the 21st hour of the 21st day of the 21st week of the 21st year of the 21st century. I thought you'd really want to know that. That's why I shared that with you. I found that interesting. But way back in the first century, and, and I guess I think it's pretty cool when you think about it now. It's, um, it's, we live in A.D., the year of our Lord, 2021. It all, it all stems around when Jesus came. But... The, the early disciples had to be beleaguered, bewildered, and discouraged at times. Now, why would I say that? And some of you are just like, hey, preacher, they're really successful. I mean, they, they got the gospel out. Yes, they eventually did. But there was a point where they, they couldn't see it happening. Why do I think that? Well, there's 12 of them. And we forget one of them was a traitor. And John points out that there were some things along the way that weren't so kosher that Judas was doing with money. And they were aware of it. And somehow Jesus seemed to let that slide. Who knows? But one of them's a traitor. There was one time where John, uh, Jesus was preaching. He had a crowd of 5,000 people. He, so, he spoke in such a manner that 4,988 of them left. And then he invited the 12 that are there. You guys want to go too? You, 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 you want to stick around or you want to go? The disciples had to be like, we thought we were going somewhere. John the Baptist said, this is the guy. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And John made a big stir. Jesus makes a big stir. And now it's not only that people are abandoning Jesus. Now there's real opposition. How severe was it? John the Baptist, the one who goes before Jesus and says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He sends a messenger to Jesus and says, are you really the one to come or should, should we expect somebody else? What's he saying? You're not getting it done. And then there's this opposition that ended with the death of Jesus. 
Yes, we know he rose from the dead and then he ascended. And how about this huge crowd of followers? Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time. And yet in the upper room, it says that there was only 120 hardcore followers that he had. 120. You're going to tell me that they weren't discouraged before the Holy Spirit came? They had to be. So Jesus told them a story that they can look back upon, that we can look back upon, that reminds us of just the the reality of, of what the kingdom of God is like. And that's exactly what he said. So Jesus tells them a short story. When I say a short story, I mean very short. I'm sure they're like, Jesus, could you expand on that just a little bit? Mark chapter 4, verse 30. And uh, it also appears in Luke's gospel and and Matthew's as well. Jesus said, how can I describe the kingdom of God? And I think these guys are all just like, oh, you're into the kingdom of God. Yeah, so, but things aren't going so good. Here's what he says. What story should I use to illustrate it? It is like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. And it grows long branches and birds can make nests in its shape. Now, i, I got to be honest, I've read that a bunch of times, and it's kind of like, okay, it starts out small, gets big. All right, moving right along. Because I mean, it's, it's not very long. I'm sure one of the disciples, wait a minute, is he done already? I, I, I wasn't paying attention, I missed it. And Mark's like, that's okay, I got it, and Matthew's got it, and Luke's got it. You get the point. Oh, did you get the Chicago Connect there? Mustard. See, you can only have mustard, and I said, catch up with my logic. That's, 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 that's the only joke I've got for you. I hope you like it. But I'm sure that some of the disciples, after Jesus tells this story, they're like, is that all you got? That's supposed to encourage us? I've got to tell you a story about my dad, who's in his final days. And he had sundowners, which means it's dementia, but it only hits later in the day. And one of us, my brother Rick or I, would always pray with him before you know, we left at night. This <laughs> One night... <laughs> I prayed for him, and then, and Heidi, Heidi doesn't like the story because she feels like he would be so embarrassed. I think my dad would get a big kick out of it now, you know, because he doesn't have dementia anymore. He's, he's well. He's in heaven. But he just looked at me, and he goes, is that all you got? I, I prayed. I mean, I thought I prayed a pretty good prayer. Now, anybody who knows me and my brother knows, well, let me put it this way. In our family, if we're about to eat a nice big meal, and there's all this food there, and people are hungry... Our family will elect me to pray instead of Rick, okay? I pray shorter prayers than Rick does. But I think my dad preferred, but is that all you got? See, I think that's, that's the line. Is that all you got? The disciples are looking at this mustard seed. Now, the fact of the matter is a cypress seed is smaller than a mustard seed. But it was just this colloquialism. It was this thing that, that they had in their culture where everything was like, oh, man, this guy's got nothing. He's just got a mustard seed. That's what Jesus was saying. You think you got nothing, but you have something that's similar to a mustard seed that's going to grow up into something that's really big. You got nothing, but you really got something. Here's what Jesus, I believe, is saying. This is God's kingdom. It will survive, it will thrive, it will grow. I guarantee it. And another thing, it will never end. People are going to remember that Rome killed me. Ha! Big deal. I come back, Rome goes away. Jesus is trying to communicate to his disciples the, the nature of the kingdom of God, that it's, it's eternal. So if you're building in the kingdom of God, you can't lose. Read the end of the book. I've been doing a study in the book of Revelation, which I didn't want to do, but in a way I didn't expect it's, it's been something that's been really helpful for me. But read the end of the book. God can't lose. He makes it very clear. Evil will be judged. Evil will lose. Love will win. God will win. So whose side do you want to be on? Now, I've mentioned this before that I've got a friend. He's a Cubs fan. His name is Joe. And I think he still is nervous about Game 7 of the World Series with the Cubs and, and, the, and the Cleveland Indians. I've told him a few times. It's like, the Cubs won. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Now, I'll tell you right now, watching the White Sox, they make me nervous. Their bullpen makes me very nervous. Now, they're in first place, and you think I'd just be happy they're in first place. No, I'm very nervous when I watch them. But you know what I do sometimes? If I get on YouTube, and I'm like, oh, I want to see Paul Canerco's home run, the Grand Slam from the World Series. I enjoy watching the 2005 World Series. I, I, I enjoy watch, I'd enjoy watching Game 7 of the, of the Cubs World Series as well. Sometimes it's fun to watch things without being nervous, because you know how it ends. You, you ever wonder, I mean, some... 
you know, when I was a kid, you watched Wizard of Oz once a year. It was an event. You gathered around the black and white TV, and you knew that if there were some color things in there that were really cool, but we couldn't see them. But, you know, then, like by the time that I was working with students back in the 90s, man, people would watch movies every day. I remember a summertime, and some students were like, yeah, yeah, I've watched that movie every day this summer. It's like, how can you do that? Don't you know how it ends? When you like the ending, you can watch again and again. What else is he saying? That sometimes that the kingdom of God, it starts something really small, but it, it flourishes exactly where you think it wouldn't. I remember summer of 88 took a, a group of teenagers to inner city Philadelphia. It was the first time we'd done an inner city trip. Parents were okay sending their kids to Haiti, okay sending their kids places like Mexico, Jamaica, but inner city America, I'm just being honest, people thought, well, that's, that's more dangerous. But one of the things that I thought was so cool because sometimes people look at the problems in the inner city and they can be, oh, that's kind of depressing, whatever. But we hooked up with some people in, in Philadelphia at the Second Mile Center, not the one that became famous for something else later, but my friend Jerry Sterrett's place. It was a thrift store. It was like the Saks Fifth Avenue of thrift stores. But they hired people that wouldn't be able to get jobs other places. Unemployed people, people coming out of prison, people with addictions. The only thing that they had to agree to is that every morning for about an hour that, that the team would get together, they would pray for one another, they'd, do all, they'd focus on Jesus. And we, just, we had a great time. I remember that was kind of like a mustard seed moment for me. I saw the kingdom of God advancing in the inner city. It wasn't some mega church. It was a thrift store. It was cool. It was so cool. Then later that summer, I went to Hong Kong and we were smuggling Bibles into mainland China. Hong Kong was not a part of China at, at that point. I won't go into the whole history lesson. And China, of course, had, had outlawed Bibles coming in and, and all this different stuff and missionaries were kicked out and the Western world is just like oh my goodness You know the church is is gonna fall apart in China the kingdom of God is not going to exist It'll evaporate because we as missionaries cannot go in what happened revival in China There's an underground church that probably was stronger than the church in the United States of America And that's part of what I discovered there again Mustard seed. When we're discouraged and we think good's losing, God's not, not able to do what, what he needs to do here on earth. He is not worried. And that's, I believe, what he's trying to tell us through this parable. Jesus invites us to something that is bigger than ourselves, the kingdom of God. It is bigger than anything, and it lasts forever. So, I think Jesus would acknowledge, and I could give you a chapter and verse in, in Matthew chapter 6 about in, in this world you'll have tribulation. Jesus said life is hard. I'm paraphrasing, but he said it in a number of ways. But I think what he's saying to us is grab a hold of my dream. I want to go ahead and, and take a, there's a verse that's, sometimes we kind of find it to be a challenging one. But what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 I'll read it, and then I'm going to give you a paraphrase of it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. That's verse 24. Verse 25, If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. I think what he's saying is, You've got your own dreams. And man, this, this is so true. When I came to Jesus, lo, those many years ago, over 40 years ago, I had my dreams. My life has not gone anything like what I expected it to go like. But if I've learned anything, it's more to grab a hold of Jesus' dream. That's, I think, what he's saying here. Let go of your dreams. Some of them, are there certain dreams that you've had you're just like, oh my goodness, that was like the worst idea ever. Thank you that that didn't come to fruition. That would have been a money pit. It would have been terrible. It would have been horrible. Grab a hold of Jesus' dream. That's what he's saying here. I've got the kingdom of God. It's the winning team. Get on board. Life can be hard. I mentioned tornadoes, pandemics, politics. What, what's God's end game? What, what, through, why is there this difficult life? Why are things not easier than, than they are? So, I think it was Max Lucado who said it. God loves you. He loves you just the way you are. And he loves you too much to leave you just the way you are. I am grateful that God doesn't just say, oh, Paul Gleiman, he's a good guy. Yeah, no, nothing you need to change. Well, color your hair a little bit or something. No, God has a standard. 
I say this at pretty much every wedding that I do. I did one here just a couple weeks ago, and I said it right here. You can take a look around. Take a look around at a wedding, even if there's identical twins there. There are no two people that are exactly the same. There just aren't. God doesn't have an external standard is the point. He has an internal standard, and that standard is Jesus. Jesus came that we might take on his divine nature that we might become like him. The internal standard is love. I could read 1 Corinthians 13 to you. Love is patient. Love is kind. It keeps no record of wrongs. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. I think most of us know the passage. There's another passage in Romans that I think is, is very important as to kind of God's end game. What, why we sometimes we go through the difficulty that we do. It's Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. Paul says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. What? Well, now that's counterintuitive. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials? How many of you just go, oh, I've got problems and trials. I'm, I'm just going to be happy about it. No, that's not normally our response. But here's what he says. For we know that they help us develop endurance. Oh yeah, endurance is important. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Wow. So all this suffering, like God wants to bring something good out of it. Problems and trials. There'll be plenty. You add grace to that. You add the love of God to that. And then in the process, we become like Jesus. It's a process. The biblical term is sanctification, the process by which we become like Jesus. So, some of you sports fans will like this, some of you non-sports fans, uh, maybe not so much. What do Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Fernando Tatis Jr. have in common? And I know some of you are going to say, aha, they both have Jr. at the end of their name. And that is true, that is in common. They're both named after their fathers, that's true as well. Both of them had fathers who were Major League Baseball players. Is it any surprise that they are both fantastic young baseball players? Steph Curry doesn't have the junior. His real first name is Wardell, as a matter of fact. I believe that's what it is. But his dad, Del Curry, was an NBA basketball player. Is it any surprise that he became a basketball player, a great basketball player? What's my point? They had dad's DNA. They, they, they had a good shot at being good at something because their dad was good at something. And when God gave us his Holy Spirit, he gave us his DNA. It's just a matter of time if we cooperate that we become more like our Heavenly Father. Further on in the book of Romans, we read this. They're pretty, these verses are pretty well known, but I think a lot of times we take them out of context. But it says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to to his purpose for them. So what would the definition of work for good, what, what's God's end game? Well, I said it's to become like Jesus. And the next verse proves it. Verse 29, for God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Jesus is our big brother. So what's that saying? It's saying that God is going to use good stuff to make us like Jesus. No, he'll use everything. Just like back earlier in the book of Romans, that trials, problems, tribulations, God's going to use that to develop our character, to cause us to become more like Jesus. That is the good. Everything. So I was reading in, a, in this book by Jerry Sitzer, and he says, remember the movie Groundhog Day? Well, I remember it quite well, because a friend of mine, Whitney White, was the executive or associate producer. And so I got to be on set, and I got to meet different people. And it's kind of funny that the main character was Phil Connors. And he's this arrogant weatherman, and he has to go out to Puxatawney to see the groundhog. But then the storm hits, so he has to spend another night there. And he just keeps waking up, and it's, it's Groundhog Day. And he hears, I got you, babe, on the radio. Sonny and Cher, if you remember the movie. One of the funny things is that, that ironically, that the, it's really the story of the transformation of his life. Then he's, he's really kind of this selfish, arrogant guy. And then once he figures out he's playing the, the day over and over again, he decides to, well, I can drink all I want. I can have all the sex that I want. I can play with romance. I can play with people's hearts. I can do anything I want to do. And then he gets bored with that after a while. And he keeps waking up Groundhog Day over and over and over again. But then he starts realizing, no, you know, I can, I can, 
I mean, he actually becomes a doctor. He does all these different things. He studies. He betters himself. He decides, I can become a better person in this day. And then he decides he can help other people. There's this couple that's breaking up. He helps them. There's, there's a guy that's choking. He, helps, he does all these different things. And I can remember where he just kind of walks by, just does all this stuff. And then finally, he wakes up, and it is February 3rd. But not just the day has changed. He has changed. And I think that's the gospel. God allows us to go through everything that we go through so that we change, so that we become more like Jesus. That's, that's God's end game. That's what he wants to do in our lives. Do you know that we become like whatever we worship? And everybody worships something. Now, there are some people who say, I don't worship anything. There's a good chance, really, for people who believe that they don't worship anything, that they do worship someone. They worship themselves. There's a lot of people that worship themselves. A lot of people think that everyone should just think exactly the way that they think. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5, the latter part, it says that certain people in the Old Testament, they worshiped worthless idols and they themselves became worthless. Why? We become like what we worship. If we worship computers, we're going to become like computers. We're going to be a little dead emotionally, probably. I could go on and on with this, but we need to worship Jesus. And I love this passage. And I was sharing this with the Bible study the other day. And part of it's just that I have been, I've just taught more in the, in the last year, probably than in any other year of my life. And sometimes I feel like I'm just constantly reading the Bible to teach instead of just reading the Bible to read the Bible, to, to, to get a glimpse of Jesus. And I love this verse. It says, Dear friends, this is 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. We are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we know that, that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. That presents something that's very true about worship. The more that we can see Jesus, the more we're going to become like him. And it says to see him as he really is. I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine that I went to high school with a number of years ago, and uh, he's not a believer. But he asked me, he said, I don't mean to be offensive, but like, what brand of Jesus do you, and I totally understood what he was saying. He goes, I know there's a lot of different types of Christianity. What type of Christianity, how would you define yourself? And I would say, I'm an a, a evangelical Christian, love, love God, love people, you know, but you get the idea. There's different ways you can describe it. But, but am I really presenting Jesus? And I think about this, folks, because that's, that's, that's what I do. That's my calling, is to present Jesus to people. Am I giving an accurate picture? Because someday I'm going to meet him. And, and I, I want to be as close as I can. But that's the heart of worship, to see Jesus as he is. And as we see him, we become like him. He invites us to become like him. Now, there's a line from an old song, and it says that a diamond is formed by pressured years. How many of you remember the old black and white Superman on TV, George Reeves? Wasn't that it before? It was Christopher Reeves. Just a coincidence, not related. But George Reeves, he took a piece of coal, and he squeezed it in his hand, and what did it become? It becomes this diamond, okay? Yeah, it would be nice if you could do that. The truth of the matter is it doesn't happen overnight, and you can't speed up the process. I think that a lot of us would say, yeah, I'd like to become like Jesus. I think a lot of times it happens when we least expect it. There's a, a song by Mark Cohen, and I just think he's a phenomenal singer-songwriter. It's called She's Becoming Gold. And it's just a woman um, who's going through all sorts of trials and difficulties in her life. And let me just share the, the words with you. She runs down the staircase and into the yard, and she goes down to the end of the drive with her friends on the phone and her angels on guard. She's just recently feeling alive after all the tears and the changes, now there's something that's taken a hold. She's becoming gold. She's becoming gold. She thinks of a boy that she knew back in school, and she wonders if he's doing all right. The man of her dreams isn't all that he seems, and the baby don't sleep through the night. Something is moving inside, inside her, and the weather is turning so cold. But she's becoming gold. She's becoming gold. She can hear in the distance the sound of the cars, and she sees the snow falling down on the hill. Now the trees and the houses are white as the stars, and she doesn't want to cry, but she probably will. And she thinks about all of life's mystery, 
and how slowly the answers unfold. And she's becoming gold. She's becoming gold. I love that song. It's right when people don't realize it. It's right when they're in the midst of so many things that are going wrong. It's when they're in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, when all these things are happening to them. They don't realize that they're, they're morphing into, into Jesus. I'm not saying it happens, the bad stuff just makes that happen, but in Christ, with the DNA that he's given us, with the, with the Holy Spirit, and when we focus on Jesus, the more that we can see him, the more that, that we can, in the midst of everything else going wrong. Yeah. I love Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It says that God will bring to completion the good work that he started in you. God doesn't have any unfinished projects. Me, I do. I took guitar lessons for a while. I'm going to take them again in heaven. I'll have all eternity to learn how to play guitar, and I can jam with Clapton and other people. But I have a lot of unfinished projects. God has none. You will not be an unfinished product project, and you're not a project. You're a son, you're a daughter. But the good work that he began in you, he will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. My wife comes up with tapes, videos, movies, audio, and photographs that confound the world. I mean, we'll go to someone's house and like, here's some photos. Where did you get these? And I'll just say, Heidi found them, you know, in a drawer. I don't know. So I walk in the room the other night and this very interesting video is up at Camp Iwana. And there was this young guy, young preacher. And um, it was me from about, uh, I was about 37 years old. And I know exactly when it, it took me a little while to place what it was. It was a very significant evening. Um, we were up at Camp Iwan. It was fall camp. I was supposed to have a special speaker up there. I would always bring an outside speaker in just so the students could hear another voice. And um, his name was Michael McNamee, and he was an awesome speaker. And the day we're supposed to go up on Friday, he says, yeah, I, I, I can't make it. I, he, I forget what it was. It was a long time ago. So I was going to have to be the speaker. I'm like, ah, you know, I didn't have anything planned. So the other thing that I knew that was in play was there was this young guy that was coming down from Wisconsin. His name was Dave Nelson. And Dave was coming and he was going to meet with the board. And if the board liked him, he was going to become the, the new youth pastor and I was going to take over college. Nobody knew that but me and Pastor Carr. And that night, I'll, ne I'll never forget it, at dinner that night, I, I called back to the church and I found out that it was a go. And so that meant that the next morning, after we had communion, after we shared, um, that would kind of drop that, that bomb. So it was just a very significant time. But I, I look back on that person. That was, I was wrapping up 12 years of youth ministry. It, it was just a wonderful run. So enjoyed it and never thought I'd get back into youth ministry. But as I looked at that person on that video this, this week, when I mean, I guess was transfixed when I, it, not just on me, but all these other students and just people. It's like, oh my goodness, look at so-and-so. But I couldn't help but to think how much my life has changed since then. So much has changed. Heidi and I have talked about it in the 13 plus years that, that we've been married. Like, you know, you can do these tests that like if, if there's a death in the family, if, if, if you lose a job, if, if, you know, all these, all these different things and, you know, if you move, all these different stressors. Well, we just like break the charts. I mean, it just, it's just crazy what's everything that's happened. So am I trying to say that, that through that I can see that I'm becoming gold? No, I, I can't see that. I, I think it's hard for us to see it. I, I do want to have a pure devotion to Christ. I want to see Jesus as he is, and I want to become more like him. I would say I think I'm a better pastor, although sometimes I hear things that indicate to me that, that perhaps I'm not. But I do know that life has been so different for me in the past 25 years than it was the first 30, 37 years. So many changes. My story, right out of um, Amazing Grace. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. God has been good. So life is a struggle, but the kingdom of God survives, it thrives, and it never ends. And Jesus invites us to be on board with the kingdom of God. Back in that passage, Romans chapter 5, it doesn't use the word perseverance in the, uh, in the New Living Translation. But I'm pretty sure the word that's there uh, back in the Greek is, the, is hupomeno. It means to remain under. 
It's kind of like that, that piece of coal that all those pressured years make it a diamond. I think that as we remain under, as we persevere, that, that we become like Jesus. I think of some people in the Old Testament. The Bible is just replete with, with stories of people that persevered. And again, we, we do a disservice to them and to ourselves if we just read the end of the story. But try to put yourself in Moses' shoes. He's 80 years old. He's on the lamb because he's a murderer. So he's out in the backside of the desert. And God starts talking to him through a bush. In his best days, the reason that we know who Moses is, we're still ahead of him. He persevered big time. Abraham, yeah, we, he's the father of a nation. He's going around with a name that means father of a multitude. And he's walking around with his cane and he's like, yeah, but I haven't got any kids. He persevered. And that's why we remember him. David, shepherd boy, rises to the point where he's a mighty warrior. And then he's anointed king. Only the existing king loses his mind and is trying to kill him. So he's in exile. He becomes king finally. And then he's in exile again with his son on the throne. David had to persevere. He had to remain under. Life is not easy. It's not intended to be. Joseph, he was the dreamer. Yeah, someday you guys are all going to bow down to me. Oh, yeah, thanks, Joseph. I think we'll sell you into slavery, which is what they did. And so you got a dreamer in prison and all the things that happened to him. But Joseph persevered. Joseph could always see the unseen goodness of God. I don't know how he did it, but he saw the unseen goodness of God. And all were dramatically used for God's glory. All advanced God's kingdom, so to, say, so to speak, in their generation. The question is, will we? Will we persevere? God has done his part. He's given us his spirit. God calls you and I to persevere, to become like Christ in the process. It's in that persevering. It's when we don't realize it. It's when the baby won't sleep at night. All those other things that were in the song. That's when we're becoming gold. And sometimes we plant mustard seeds for future generations. You know, I even wonder about it, about recording this, and this goes off into the, the ethernet. It's out there, who knows where. And I often find out throughout the course of a week that I, like I was at a Rotary meeting and I find out that one of my friends from Rotary is like, oh yeah, I was watching the Words of Hope devotional this morning. It's like, cool. I had no way of knowing that. I have no way of knowing certain things. And I just wonder sometimes who gets to see something and the difference that it could make because that's the beauty of, of the kingdom of God. It's eternal. God's word is eternal. It doesn't return to him void. So I was reading something in, in Yancey's book, Grace Notes, and... Um, I really, I really like this, and I want to share some of this with you. It's about Johann Sebastian Bach. He was born in the shadow of the Wartburg Castle, which is where Luther translated the Bible into German. And he probably is more associated with muse, this uh, a composer who's associated with the church probably more than any others. Um, but he didn't write. A lot of composers would write for the king or something like that. He he wrote for God, and, and most of his manuscripts at the top, at the top of them, would, there'd be a J and a J, and that would stand for Jesus' help. In German, it came out, Jesus' help. And then at the end, it would have SDG, which is Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone the glory. So I was aware of that, and right before I was working on the message today, and I knew I was going to probably wrap up with this, I just thought, wouldn't that be a great way to start every day and to end every day? To just in the morning just say, J.J., Jesus, help me today. Help me to represent you well. And when the day is over, if there's anything that I did that was of any real value or, or consequence, to you be the glory. Well, I love this story of, of all of Bach's works. The Passion, according to St. Matthew, is generally acclaimed to be the greatest choral work in the German language. Uh, it, when he originally wrote it in 1729, uh, it got one performance. And it, some very polite applause, I suppose. But then, 100 years later, in 1829, Felix Mendelssohn obtained a copy of it from his teacher, who allegedly bought the original from a cheese merchant using worthless manuscript pages to wrap cheese. So there's these old pieces, of, 100 years old, I guess it's good for wrapping cheese. 
And Mendelssohn finds it, and he's just like, this, this is a masterpiece. This is a masterpiece. And not only did Mendelssohn put that into, you know, uh, perform that for people, it's what caused Bach to become the sensation that he's become. And since then, since 1829, that it has never ebbed. He, he's been a fixture in, in, in classical music ever since. And Yancey talks about being at Ravinia. He used to live in the Chicago area. And he said how that, that this piece of music that, that is so dramatic and it's with the, the death and the, the passion of Jesus that, and the, the heartbreak, but also it portrays the, the significance of, of the greatest event in, in human history, perhaps other than the resurrection of Jesus, but this great sorrow that, that, that goes into it. And he talks about the diverse crowd that's at Ravinia. He said, you've got your, your North Coast Jewish folks that are there. You've got your people, this is a few years ago, but you get these scruffy folks that are wearing their blue jeans. And then you got these really wealthy people there, but he could tell that, that the music was just so beautiful. But the point of the story is this, you do something for the glory of God, its significance never ends. Hundreds of years later, the mustard seed that's planted is still growing. Bach's music is still living for the glory of God. The things that we do for Jesus, and we, we will never know until eternity the significance of the choices that we make. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to know that, that your kingdom is like a, a mustard seed. Sometimes we think that you're losing, but you are not. And your kingdom is advancing, sometimes against the most incredible odds. Father, I pray for people that are struggling today, that, that they could give their dreams to you. And some of those dreams you'll bring to fruition, but others we set aside and we say, Jesus, I want to live for your dream. Because your dream's forever. And if, if, there's, if there's one process that I think you've tried to take me through from day one when I chose to follow you, it's that, is to put aside your, your hopes, your dreams mine and take up yours. Father, I pray for people that are really struggling today, and I pray that you would just whisper a word by the power of your spirit that they are becoming gold, that your Holy Spirit does dwell within them, and that they have your DNA, and that they will become more and more like you, Jesus. Encourage people with that today. We have a spiritual enemy who likes to whisper just the opposite. Bless your people today. May it be to your glory. In your name I pray. Amen. My every thought
So glad you could join us and just want to leave you with that powerful thought from Romans chapter 8 that God uses everything, everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly to make us more like Jesus if we just allow it. God bless you. Have a great week.